And let's go out to the big garden and see what's happening out there. We've got lots of good stuff. We're having a nice overcast day. It's actually about 8.30 in the morning, and usually it would not be a good time to shoot, but because it's overcast, I thought it would be a good time to get this done. So this is the June garden, late June, early July. And we will take a tour and I'll show you what we got. You can't even see the tomatoes on the back there. So we'll start on this end. So these are the Marion berries. And I've got a surprisingly good amount of fruit on here this year. They produce on second year growth. And so all the stuff laying on the ground that you see, that's all this year's growth. And I need to tie that up. The idea is to tie up this, this year's growth onto these lower wires. And then the second year growth gets tied up onto the high wires. And then at the end of the season, you cut um, the stuff off the high wires and move the lower stuff up. And that way you've always got both years going at once. Um, but yeah, I'm getting some good fruit in here. This is probably not quite ripe yet. It needs another day or two, but we're getting there we're almost. That's fun, very exciting. But we, if we get a really cold, winter it will kill off the previous year's growth you can see this is bird pecked the birds have been getting in here i'm gonna go ahead and pick that hmm, not bad i'm not shy about bird cross contamination obviously but yeah if you get a really cold winter it will kill off all of that previous year's growth and then you don't get any fruit Mm. Very nice. Ooh, that one wasn't quite ripe. A little bit sour. Yikes. All right. This row, you can see I have two different age groups happening here and a whole lot of grass weed. This is sorghum and I am just letting it do its thing. It's on a drip. I'm not worried. I'm gonna let it battle out with the grass. I planted it super heavy, and so I'm not expecting all of it to survive. We'll see what happens. But if I get a crop, I'm gonna buy an actual cane press this year and make sorghum syrup with a press instead of the way I did it last year. That's kind of fun. My three rows of garlic, not quite ready. I did harvest scapes, and I have a nice video all about garlic, more than you could wanna know about garlic and garlic scapes and then a recipe for garlic scape pesto. If you wanna take a deep dive into that subject, give that a view. Um, I'm pretty proud of the information that's in there because it took a long time for me to learn all of that stuff. And I am, I've lost a good chunk. I've lost some to gophers and then I asked because we, we mulched this with leaf mulch and I actually think the mulch was a little bit too deep and things got too wet and I think I lost some stuff to rot as well. So. Not gonna be a super great harvest this year, but not bad. This is, this is a couple of more uh, collard greens. I just had the extra space. Clearly should not have planted them across from each other. Not nearly enough room. And then as you know, I love to have flowers throughout. So I've got marigolds. I've got stunning. Whew, look at that poppy, holy moly. That's a beauty. So these are a type of Shirley poppy and these just reseeded. I had them in here last year and they've reseeded this year and I've just let them do their thing. But look at all the pollinators, you guys. This is why you put flowers in your garden if for no other reason. The pollinators are so happy. I have extra Swiss chard out here that's actually, other than looking like it's getting slug eaten, is actually doing better than the stuff I have in the raised bed garden. So that's good. These were just extra plants I didn't sell. And I had some room out here because I didn't have the garlic in every spot and so I just threw it out here and I think I might get a nice crop out of that so that was probably serendipitous. This is a volunteer sunflower. Look at that beauty. Lovely. I love the sunflowers and then obviously just so many poppies all over the place. These red ones are so gorgeous. And then I have plugged in here. I had some extra flowers that I didn't have a place for and so they all went into this 
these garlic beds just because I had extra room. There's a volunteer. Actually, no, I think I planted that one. So there's another calendula. This is a hollyhock. That one looks really happy, actually. We'll see how that does. Hopefully we'll send up a beautiful stock and by the next video, you'll see hollyhock blossoms. Wouldn't that be something? This weedy row that you see here is perennial. So there's rhubarb in here. There's Jerusalem artichoke, also called sunchokes. I have some feverfew that reseeds and comes back every year. More poppies. And there's a few herbs scattered in here that I just haven't. This is the row that I was telling you about last tour that I haven't weeded. And I'm in no big hurry to weed, honestly. This is some oregano that I did weed around this. It is now blooming gloriously because I didn't harvest it soon enough. But I have a lot of oregano right now, so I'm not too worried about it. Look at that. Look at the damage on this. Holy moly. I'm not sure if that's slugs or something else, but something is really going to town on these rhubarb leaves. More power to them. I don't care. It's okay. Um, this is what rhubarb seed looks like. And I usually cut these off and that's why there aren't a ton of them in here, but I missed a few. And I end up with volunteer rhubarb here and there. And so sometimes it's not bad to leave a few seeds because sometimes you get a whole new plant. That is a volunteer rhubarb. It is clearly just getting chewed. I need to throw some slug bait out. That's just obnoxious. I came down here because I wanted to show you this. This is Dyer's Coreopsis also called tick seed coreopsis. And it is a North American annual, um, grows in the prairies of North America. I absolutely love this flower. It's used to, you can use it as a dye for cloth, which is why it's called dyer's coreopsis. But it is one of my very, very favorite blossoms. And these are reseeds. I had a bunch in here last year and they just reseeded a little bit. So I've got a few. And again, a bee pollinator, baby. This is more of the anise hyssop, complete with bee, very nice. That's a bumblebee, I think. But this is what that other anise hyssop in my other raised bed looks like when it blooms. And this is a really lovely tea. It has a slightly anise flavor. It's in the mint family. You can tell that by that square four-sided stem. And it's a perennial, but it's kind of a short-lived perennial. And so I usually have new plants coming every year because it'll last a year or two and then it kind of conks out. Um, this is volunteer dill that just came up in the same bed. I had a bunch of dill in here last year, so I'm just letting it do its thing. A little bit of chaos in the garden. This is, ignore the weed, this is um, horseradish. And that bloomed this year for the first time, so that was fun. Don't usually see that. Here are my, oh, I really need to weed. I was gonna weed before I took you guys out here, but today was the day to do this tour, so I didn't weed. Um, these are my three rows of onions. And you saw, I have a whole video on planting onions from seed, why I plant onions from seed. Let me get you down here where you can really see. And so here's our onion bed right now. These are really starting to take off. They look amazing. The weeds in here were incredible, you guys. It took like two weeks of me coming out because these are close enough together that it's very hard to weed with a, a tool. And so I ended up hand weeding 300 feet of onions. Let's not do that again. Um, this coming up right there, that's a volunteer Thai basil. Um, I totally recognize that. I had some Thai basil in here last year. So yeah, getting some volunteers here and there, which is fun. Um, but yeah, so these are the onion beds. I won't take you down each row. You don't need to see them. I had, you can see down there where there's that cage and that stick sticking out, that's a hoe. I had a queen lime zinnia in there as a divider between two onion varieties. And it just, that plant disappeared in a day. I have no idea if a deer came along and ate it. It was the weirdest thing but I had a volunteer tomatillo and so I threw a tomatillo in there instead. Um, more flowers, we've got marigolds in between here and then some extra peppers that I had. So all kinds of flowers coming along. And then I've got some rosemary. I did buy some rosemary pots. 
So I've got rosemary in here, and then these are Volunteer potatoes, and I will probably dig these potatoes sometime in the next two weeks so that this rosemary gets more sun. But sometimes if something's in a bed that I'm not worried about, I just let it go. More calendula. This one is my favorite. Oh my goodness. Absolutely love that. This is one, the only variety of onion that I planted that is not happy. Most of them died. I have two left. And I think these were the sweet onions and they're not, oh, there's, there's one more over there. These guys are not really well suited to the cycle that I had them on. And so I think that's why they didn't do well, but very unhappy. This is another marigold that came from a seed swap. I mean, how fun is that? And it's gonna be nice and tall. Gotta show you the flowers, man. All right, so leeks in here as well. This is all shallots. And then the rest of that row is leeks. Oof, and the weeds are getting bad again. And it takes a lot to keep up with these. See how this is disappearing in the ground? That's a gopher, I think, so. Yeah, we've been battling gophers. I just caught one yesterday. Here's another one of those huge yellow marigolds. Gorgeous. And then the rest of this row is cilantro, except for a volunteer uh, marigold, probably. Um, and I planted this specifically for the seed, so I'm not trying to get leaves off of this. I am letting it bolt so that I can collect the seed for coriander. And so this is, it's a little bit weedy, this is mostly most of the weed that's in there is purslane and this is edible and it's a very low growing ground cover and honestly it's kind of a good mulch and it doesn't really do a lot of competition with the plants and so I tend to leave a lot of it in. I have a recipe for purslane tacos that I've been meaning to make for years and have never gotten around to. Maybe this will be the year that I do that and I'll do a video for you guys. Um, but it's totally edible. This is our melon row. And I have four of these uh, Israeli green melons, cantaloupe. And then all the rest of the row is Hannah's Choice cantaloupe, which is my very, very favorite. I absolutely love it. Um, we got a lot of cardboard out here to use as mulch in between so the plants can eventually just sprawl on that cardboard and there won't be so many weeds. Eventually they're gonna climb into the aisles and I won't be able to mow in here anymore. So I try to keep up with this as long as I can and move, um, see how this guy is starting to go out. And this guy is starting to go out. I will pick those up and redirect them so that they're going lengthwise instead of out. And I do that for a while, and then eventually I lose that battle and I just let it go. But, oh, look at all the blossoms. Look at all the flowers, you guys. So, yeah, we're going to get some good cantaloupe in there. It's going to be awesome. This is the corn row. Pretty sparse and very, very weedy. And I've given up the battle on this. And so we'll see what we get. I've weeded around the individual corn plants just so they have a little bit of breathing room, but it was too much. And I didn't put enough seed in here and I'm probably not gonna get good pollination because of that. And so at this point, I am just letting nature take its course and maybe I'll get lucky and get some sweet corn out of here, but I'm not counting on it. I think this is mostly gonna be a loss. And that's okay, some days, some years you win some, some years you lose some. This is the bean bed. And I have a bunch of different kinds of beans in here. And then clearly a few volunteer sunflowers as well. Um, at the very end of the row, I have some edamame. And then I've got, I think four or five different varieties of beans in here. I need to come through here. I've been doing some weeding in here, but not a lot. Eventually the plants, the bean plants get big enough that they shade out most of the other stuff that's in here. And so I tend to, I weed pretty heavily early in the season. And then I just kind of selectively weed later in the season. 
I'm growing these for seed, and so I don't, not every plant has to be 100% happy. As long as I get some good seed out of it, I'm good. So, all right, let's talk about the star of the show right now. Look at the sunflower row. This is all volunteer sunflowers, you guys. I did not plant a single one of these, and I actually tilled the soil. I till this bed every three or four years just to kind of knock the weeds back, and there's so many seeds in there that it just grows back on its own. Amazing. Most of these are yellow, but we do have some that have some good color. I don't know if you guys can see this. There's a gold long beetle in here, and I see them every year in these sunflowers. I have no idea what they are, but they're clearly not doing any damage. And so I just let them go. It's, I could just, you could make an entire PhD out of just the insects that are on the sunflowers in the garden. It's really kind of amazing. Oh, you guys, look. Can you see? So there's regular bees in there, regular honeybees. I have a honeybee hive. But see the other insects that are in there that also have pollen all over them? Those are probably some of our native pollinator bees. How fabulous is that? So cool. Yeah, so there's always tons and tons of insects in here. And that's why this sunflower bed is in the middle of the garden, is it's a pollinator bed. And so it is food for the birds to attract birds. There's another couple of those golden little beetles. It is food for the birds, food for the pollinators, habitat so that the good guys come in and help help out compete the bad guys. Growing up through the middle of this is some morning glory. And morning glory can get super weedy and it reseeds like crazy. And so it's definitely one of those things that you, if you put it in your garden, know that you will never not have it. But I like to leave it in with the sunflowers because it climbs up the sunflowers and it's so pretty. Yeah, you can see it showing its little heads all over the place. This was a good spot for it last year. How pretty. And look how it's just climbed up that stalk. And I pulled, I think I have it in the last video, I pulled hundreds of morning glory seeds out of this bed because they had spilled out into here. In fact, there's one right there that I missed. That is a morning glory, that's not a bean. So that gives you an idea of what it does. But it is so pretty and I love how spontaneous and kind of random it is that I can't bring myself to weed it all out. I just think it's awesome. This is love in a mist. So this is not the nigella that you grow for the seed culinarily. This is just the nigella that you grow because it's gorgeous and fun. And I planted this once about 12 years ago and there's a lot of weeds in here, ignore the weeds. Um, and it has grown back every year. And it grows in so thick that it often outcompetes the weeds. Um, this is weedy this year because I did till this and so I knocked it way back and the weeds got a foothold. This is borage, also reseeds like crazy and is beloved by pollinators. The flowers taste like cucumber. So that's a volunteer as well. This is, I love plants that are flowers that reseed. And so this is really the end of this bed is things that I purposely let reseed. There's a whole bunch more borage in here just getting going. And a lot of this stuff had sprouted and then I tilled and then it had to regrow. And so it's been, everything's a little bit behind where it would normally be because of that. Here's some more gorgeous. And there's a drip irrigation in there that clearly has a hole in it. It sounds like there's a shower going on. And I haven't bothered fixing it because it's not in a bad spot. I just love how pretty this is. This is catnip. Also reseeds itself all over my farm. And again, a mint family, square stem and beloved by pollinators. There's a ladybug on there right now. And so I just let some of this go because it's a useful medicinal and 
loves, helps feed all the pollinators. This is the only perennial that's in this bed that I, I make sure I don't till this. This is Monardia or bee balm. Again, good for pollinators. Um, this is edible and you can make a tea out of it. I tried it last year, didn't love it, not really my personal taste, but totally useful as a medicinal or an edible tea as well. And this is just starting to get going. This whole thing is gonna be gorgeous in about two weeks. Let's walk down the side where we can see more of these beautiful sunflower heads. And these are just, <clears throat> these are just getting going. This hasn't hit its peak yet. We'll have another couple weeks and this is gonna be stunning. And I swear it grows inches a day. So I've seen a ton of this this year. You see that little ladybug in there? I don't know what it is about sunflowers, but ladybugs love sunflowers in our area. I always see tons and tons of ladybugs on the sunflowers. There's our little tiny native pollinators in there, be bopping around. Nice. And then this, is more calendula. Calendula is another plant that's an annual but will reseed itself. And I have a ton of it that just reseeds. And a lot of times when I have something die, I've got an open spot, I will just dig up a small calendula from somewhere else in the garden that's reseeded and poke it into that spot. So I have it scattered throughout the garden. Again, beautiful medicinal. You harvest the flowers and you can make salves out of it. It's great for the skin. I have a mix of just the traditional original yellow and orange calendula, and then um, one called Flashback, which is the one that has a little bit more of this colored leaf or colored petal on it, which I just adore. And so at this point it's kind of mixed and crossed and it's a little bit of everything, but that's okay. Another big volunteer sunflower here. Amazing. All right, so sunflowers, glorious. And obviously I have a few down here at the end of this row that I didn't have anything planted down here, so I just let them go. And they're gonna be super huge and super happy because they don't have any competition. And then the wind will blow them over, which is what happens every year. But in the meantime, we're gonna get some nice stuff out of it. This is all sweet basil. And I just came through here yesterday and pruned out the tops of all of these because um, they're all starting to flower. And they're not super big and bushy. They were probably in pots a little bit too long, but they will bush out now that I've started pruning them up. This is the sign, if you're not familiar with basil. See how that is starting to cluster? That's a sign that it's getting ready to go to seed. And you pinch that off. And this is totally usable. You can you know, make whatever you want to make or dry it out of that. It smells amazing. Um, and then it will grow from where you just pinched it off and you'll have two new plants. The problem is once it starts to go to seed like this, it really, really wants to go to seed. And so if you want to keep your plants from flowering, you literally need to be out here about every three days pinching off stuff. And so I lose the battle. I, do, I harvest it this time of year. I make some pesto to freeze. And then after that, I just let it go to flower and I make um, basil syrups. You can make basil syrup with the flower on and that's a great way to use that and prune it back. And then again, pollinators. This is also mint family, four-sided stem. And uh, let me double check that. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, this doesn't feel like a super square stem, but really great for the pollinators once it starts blooming <clears throat> like crazy. And so I just leave it. I have basil reseed occasionally, but I find that Thai basil and holy basil reseeds much more readily than regular Genovese basil. Again, plugged in some flowers, so there's a salvia tucked in there. Here's a few more basil in here. And some more salvia and some more calendula. So it's, you know, you plan and then you let go. You plan and then you let nature decide what it wants to do and that's part of the fun of it is every day you come out and you see something different because it's not what you planned. Here are those green wasabi radishes 
that I had tons and tons of seed for. And I think they're a daikon variety, we'll see. And so they should get pretty big and send out a big deep taproot. And that's actually what I put them in here for. Um, I'm not planning on eating them. I'm just planning on letting them bring up stuff from the bottom of the, or deep in the beds. This is the sapwort that I planted all through the garden this year as a spring um, plant. And this is the first time I've grown it. And it turns out it's a very early plant. And so at this point, you can see it's already ready to go to seed. Very beautiful pink, um, kind of baby's breath type plant, but I didn't realize it was gonna be quite so early. And so what I actually did is I went back through and everywhere I had one of these, I planted a snapdragon next to it. So hopefully as those completely conk out, we'll have some snapdragons. This is the potato bed, really doing well this year. Got a few weeds here and there. This is probably like the prime, prime time for the potato bed. It's a cool season plant. And once it starts to get really hot, these conk out pretty quick and don't look so great. It's always amazing to me how you can miss weeds because they look quite a bit like a potato when they're in there and then they start to flower and you're like, nope, that's a red root pigweed. You're out of here. But generally doing quite well. Um, I did have this one get eaten by a gopher and I dug it up, set a gopher trap and caught the gopher within 15 minutes of setting the trap. So that was super exciting and gratifying because I fight gophers in my potato beds every year where they get, you know, a big chunk of my potatoes because I can't see that they're in there because they're eating them from underneath. Planted throughout next to the potatoes, I have green onions and they're kind of getting shaded out right now, but they'll get some a little bit more size to them and then I'll harvest them out sometime here in about the next month. So I've got a nice little bunch of green onions that are just tucked in between. I don't think it does anything beneficial for the potatoes or for the green onions. It's just a good companion plant in terms of timing. Got some lovely potato blossoms. They say that when potatoes are blooming, there are potatoes forming underneath the ground. And so that's a good indication that we've got potatoes coming in. It's interesting, this variety, I think is the only one left that's blooming. I think everything else is done. So I can expect this to probably to be slightly later in terms of harvest than the other potatoes. And that variety ends right here. And then, yeah, this was the one variety I had that didn't do well. And so I've got flowers tucked in all over the place here. So there's <clears throat> more hollyhock, more salvia, more marigolds, another hollyhock, you know, as one does. All right, peppers. Definitely starting to get some really good growth on these. This row is getting irrigated right now. This is the typical Anaheim. This is Joe Parker. So this is a variety that is grown in Hatch, New Mexico and roasted. And that's what I'm growing them for is for roasting. That's doing quite well. I have a lot of those. And then this horizontal trellis is great for holding everything up as they get big. You get, they get tall, then you get a windstorm and everything starts conking out and falling over. It is really handy to have that horizontal trellis in there. And then we ended up just buying, these are electric poles for fencing and they're not super expensive. And so I'm using those kind of throughout to hold that horizontal trellis up because sometimes it sags and it's not where you want it to be. And it also makes mowing really, really difficult. And so I ended up investing in a few of those. They'll last for years. This is a cranberry, I think, cosmos, double click cosmos. Stunning. This has just started to bloom in the last week. So excited about it. And then there's also mixed in, there's another species of cosmos that hasn't started blooming yet. So we're gonna get a bunch of flowers in here in the next couple months. This is poblano peppers, also called 
poncho when they're dried. Look at that, you guys. I mean, come on. I did harvest one of these the other day for something we were cooking, but these are just starting to come on. This is, I think, Bastum is the variety here. Poblanos will get quite tall. They'll get up to here. And so trellis on these guys is really, really important. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Stunning. I won't go through everything here. You guys don't need to see every single pepper I have, but I'll show you the ones that are really coming on. So this is, <laughs> I think that's a cross. This is supposed to be Aleppo. That does not look like a true Aleppo. I think there's something else in there. That's probably Aleppo mixed with Anaheim. I save seed from my Aleppos. This is what an Aleppo should look like. It's got that funny little end on it and they don't get that long. So this is, this is not, so I just, because I'm saving seed, I try to save seed from the middle of the bed where I think it's least likely to be crossed with other peppers. Um, but inevitably every year I get a few that are not quite what they pretend to be. And because I can't buy Aleppo seeds commercially, I don't have any choice but to keep saving them. And so you just harvest those and do something with them personally and don't save seed from them and go on about your business the best I can do. I could cover, like if I wanted to, I could cover, you know, this with the flower on it with a little organza bag so that the bees couldn't get into it before this flower opened. And then I would know for sure that it was self-pollinated, but that's awfully fiddly and I'm super busy this time of year and I just don't have the time generally to keep up with it. Everything else I think in the rest of this row is different types of paprika. And then this purple that you see here, this is an amaranth that reseeded. And so as I was weeding, it was very obvious for obvious reasons, it's gorgeous. And so I just left it in places where it wasn't super competitive with the thing that was next to it. So we've got a little amaranth scattered about in here, which is fun. This is that other variety of Cosmos. And then this row is more of the hot. So I've got all the Joe Parkers and then I believe this is Burberry. So I'm super excited about this. This is an Ethiopian pepper. And they're brown when they're ripe. We're just starting to get some good fruit set on there. So that's very exciting. This is, I think, Thai. I usually, nope. That's cashmere. This is a great pepper. I grew this last year. I absolutely loved it. I usually, about this time of year, make flags and put them in between each variety so I can quickly glance. They all have tags on the ground, but you get to the point where it's hard to get to the tags because things are getting so big and bushy in growth. This one is gochugang. So this is a Korean. And this is probably one of the first things out here to set fruit. I'm really getting some nice fruit set on that. So that's gonna be really fun. This is the first time I've grown this one. Excited for that. I imagine it's gonna be pretty hot. So this is Sugar Rush Peach. I suspect that this is not um, Anum. I, I'm gonna have to look it up, but I have a feeling it's a different uh, genus species of pepper just because of the growth habit. It's quite different and it's been very slow to take off. So we'll see what happens with that. This is Thai and it's also very, very slow. Although I do see there's a little baby Thai pepper in there coming. These are fiddly to pick, but they're really lovely to have dried in your pantry. This is some cayenne. And then I have all the jalapeno varieties. So this is regular jalapeno, which I'm just starting to get fruit set on that. I did manage to sneak one out the other day. This is Hungarian black, relatively mild, not super hot. It'll turn red when it's ripe, but gonna be gorgeous mixed in with jalapenos in a mixed basket. And then this is the pumpkin spice jalapeno, which has been very slow, but there is one right back in there. And then this is the habanero 
which I never have great luck with. Our temperatures are not quite right for it. And so it's probably, I'll probably get a handful off of here, but so you never know, some years you get lucky. And then I had extra room at the end of this row. So this ended up being more herbs. So this is more dill. Again, growing it for seed specifically. Another anise hyssop, some Thai basil. And these were just plants that I had for sale that I didn't sell and so threw in the ground. Another absolutely stunning, stunning, stunning calendula. Good Lord, I love that. And then these are, this very end run is the Kajari melons. I'm trying those for the first time this year. And then these two are cucumbers. And I don't remember which cucumber I have where. I have lemon cucumbers and a Japanese variety out here. And then in front of these, I have some of the, the wild leeks from Pakistan. So I've got a couple of those in just to see, mostly to see what they look like when they bloom. I have a lot of them and I think I'm gonna tuck them in around the orchard trees. There's some of the stuff that was left over by the greenhouse that I haven't planted out. but encouraging everything to climb. These have really just started taking off in the last week. Our weather hasn't been super hot. And then same thing on this side. These two are cucumbers. This is interesting. I'm not sure what's happening there. There's clearly some kind of interesting growth pattern happening there. And then more Kajari melons. Oh, and the Kajaris are starting to bloom, so that's a good sign. And these have just been tall enough to be able to get up onto this trellis in the last couple of days. So they're taking their sweet time. Oh, and then again, more extra space. So a few extra snapdragons in here, lots of weeds, but again, mostly purslane, which I'm not worried about. And then more of the Holy basil. Let me get that amaranth out of there. Sneaky little bugger. Ha. That is a volunteer uh, ground cherry. Once you plant them once, you never be without them. Another anise hyssop. I dry a lot of that for a tea mix that I make. And then even more cilantro. Don't know why today in particular I'm able to see some of these weeds that I wasn't spotting earlier. This is common mallow. Anything in the mallow family is edible. Um, not necessarily tasty, but it's basically the same grouping as hibiscus. And it is really deep rooted. And so when it's small, you can pull it up pretty easily. Once it gets better size like this one you can see this is all one plant very very hard to pull out of the ground and get that tap root unless the soil is super moist and so i try to stay up on pulling it when it's little because once it's big i can't get it out of the ground what are you oh that might be a zinnia actually that looks like a zinnia well that's exciting this stuff was in pots and it's tiny size-wise and it's already starting to go to seed, but I'm growing it for seed, so I don't care. It's gonna be just fine. Let's get on to the save the most exciting thing for last. Tomatoes and tomatillos. Let me get on the other side so that I can read names. Our sun's coming out a little bit. So I have four tomatillos in here, two of one variety, two of another variety. I just harvested a couple of pounds off of them. They are ready to harvest. I missed this one. They are ready to harvest when they look like this or when they're starting to push out of the skin. So that's how you know that they're ready. So when they look like this, like I can feel the fruit in there, but it's not pushing out. This one has cracked the skin. So this one is ready. That one is ready. That's how you know they're ready to harvest. When they're really ripe, there will be a color change as well, where the outside of the husk will turn a little bit yellow. But these, these two varieties, there seems to be almost no difference between them. I harvested off of all four plants. And then this one, 
on the end. I'm having some yellowing and I'm not sure what is causing that. Although honestly, I'm looking at it today and it looks better than it did yesterday. So I think it's growing out of it, whatever was happening, which is great because I was worried I was gonna lose this plant. I was kind of thinking maybe it was a gopher who had gotten in there and started chewing on things. But yeah, it's absolutely growing out of it. So that's fantastic because I really didn't want to lose this plant. I, uh, I want lots of tomatillos this year. I'm selling them. Okay, so cherry tomatoes. I have picked everything that was ripe yesterday. So not a ton with color, but I have picked probably maybe a pound off of here so far this year. These are the Sun Cherry from Osborne Seeds. Ridiculously expensive seed, but a beautiful red cherry tomato. And this is also Osborne. This is Sun Orange instead of Sun Cherry. So it's an orange variety. This was the first one to actually have ripe fruit on it. So I've gotten quite a bit off of these already. So this is a very vigorous plant, super happy. I have two of those, two of the Sun Cherries two of the black cherries. This is black cherry, and I haven't gotten anything ripe off of these yet, so they're a little bit slower to produce, but I'm getting some nice fruit set, and you can see back in there, just starting to get a little bit of color. So another week, and those will be ready. So the idea is these six plants, these three varieties, I'm going to have a mixed basket that's going to be red, orange, and purple, and it's gonna be stunning. So that's the plan there. This is Gardener's Ecstasy, and this is new to me this year. And they're very nice. I, I need to do a side-by-side -side tasting and see which ones I like the best here, but this was probably second runner up for setting fruit quickly. So a lot of fruit on this early in the season, which has been good. This is Ivan's berry cherry. I was expecting this to be small because of the name berry. It's clearly not. I mean, I'll bring this one in. That's not a small cherry tomato. That's a great cherry tomato. So look at that. That's fun. And then this is tomados plant. Definitely a little more sparse, not as bushy, um, but I've harvested a few off of here. So we'll see how she does over the course of the season. This is a red cherry cross from my own saved seed. You guys have heard this story, but I had a um, cherry, a sun gold cherry next to a German pink big beefsteak. And I saved seeds from the, the German pink beefsteak and all of the grow outs from that seed were cherry. So it had clearly crossed with the sun gold. And then one year, some of those grow outs most of them were orange, so one of them was red, and so I saved seeds from the red cherry cross that year. I think this damage is probably from just blowing against things in the wind, because this has get, been getting beat up. Um, this has got potato leaf in terms of the style, so interesting genetics happening in there, very complex, kind of fun. This is the yellow cherry cross, so same story, but this is F2, this is F1. This is chocolate cherry sprinkle, and it is a multicolored dark purple, and it has a little nipple on the end, so kind of fun. These are gonna be gorgeous when they get ripe. Again, plant, a little more sparse, not super. And then this is Principisi. I have grown Principisi. I have two plants here. I've probably been growing this for at least 15 years. Um, and it is wildly prolific once it gets going. And you can see, can you see the tomato fruit set on that? I mean, there's probably a hundred tomatoes just right in here. And this plant is only two and a half feet tall. So we're gonna have a ton of tomatoes out of that. They start out really big and by the end of the season, they've gotten quite small and they all have this little nipple on the end. And so that's a very distinctive thing for the Principisi, but I mean, definitely getting some, we're getting close on these guys. They're not quite ready, but they're definitely close. So that's super exciting. I love this plant. I just, I, I feel like I would have bad luck 
if I didn't plant it. And then more of the amaranth as I was weeding. I had some amaranth and calendula that were volunteering and I just left them if they were in a good spot. So that's fun. This is Brandywine. She's just starting to get some good fruit on her. Hopefully you can see that one in the back. And Brandywine is another potato leaf variety. So definitely a different leaf. I have two Brandywines. That must have been a fasciated blossom. You can see the, the scarring on the bottom of that one. Two canner hole. And this is from seed from Seed Savers Exchange. And getting some nice fruit set on that. These, the brandy wine, the canner hole, and this next one, the mortgage lifter, they all have about the same size fruit. They're usually baseball to softball sized. And I slice them and dry them and sell them as dried heirloom tomatoes. For ripe, big tomatoes, mortgage lifter usually wins the race. I usually have, that's usually the first variety that I end up picking every year. But we're getting some nice fruit set on here. And some of this fruit set is actually from when they were still in the greenhouse in pots. So they're coming. Everything is coming along nicely. This is Valencia, which is a really big, beautiful yellow orange variety. Definitely baseball sized, very good tasting fruit. This one is the Japanese black trifle. I've never grown this before, but it won a taste test last year out of a lot of different varieties and so I wanted to try it. A little bit more sparse on the plant on that. Cherokee purple. Always get beautiful fruit early in the season and then so the first flush is fantastic. You can see I've got some nice fruit set there and then it pitters out to nothing and so I grow it for that first big beautiful flush of fruit because I absolutely love the flavor and then I don't expect anything from it after that because it just never does well. And you'll see that in later videos, I'm sure. Paul Robeson, this is a beautiful, really tasty black beefsteak tomato. This would be my replacement for Cherokee Purple. If I was only growing one purple tomato, it would be this one. I grew this last year for the first time. Absolutely loved it. Really big tomato when it's done. Ness Noir, also called pineapple tomato. And this is one of those ones that is multicolored when it's ripe. You can see I've got a nice one in there. Hopefully you can see that. And this was probably my favorite eating tomato last year. Incredible flavor. And I've got some very nice fruit coming in on that. This is Virginia Sweet, which is a yellow and orange striped beef steak. Don't have a ton of fruit set on this guy yet, but I really loved it last year as an eating tomato, so growing it again. Dr. Waichi, you guys probably know that if you watch Roots and Refuge Farm. It's where I got this idea for the seed. Some fruit set on here, not a ton, but it's coming. And really good flavored tomato, yellow tomato. Aunt Ruby's German Green. I didn't grow this for a couple of years and I decided I really missed it and so I'm growing it again this year. This one is ripe when it's green yellow and absolutely delicious. People are put off by it because of the color, but I actually think it's one of the best eating tomatoes I've ever had. And so definitely wanted to grow that again this year. And then everything down here is my paste tomatoes. So the first three are San Marzano Redorta. And that's from Seeds of Italy. And look at the size for, for a paste tomato that you're gonna can, which means you're gonna have to peel it. Look at the size of that fruit. And we're not even all the way done yet. Bigger fruit on a paste tomato is definitely a want for me because anything that's bigger means I don't have to peel as much fruit. And that makes me happy. So three of these, I think this was from Saved Seed because I couldn't get seed for it this year. And then these three are San Marzano as well, but this is San Marzano too from Johnny's. And tons of fruit set on this, shorter plants, more bushy plants. San Marzano Redorta always looks like it's dying. Like this is normal. Like that is absolutely what this plant looks like every year. It curled leaves, you know, it's just a mess, but great fruit. And then, I mean, compared to this, look how compact and sweet this is, but 
Also, look at the difference in the size of the fruit. Not nearly as big. Oh, I see some color. So we're starting to color up down there. That's exciting. But yeah, tons of fruit set on these. These did really good. This is a hybrid. And so I'm expecting it to be pretty good. We'll do a side-by-side -side taste test and see which one we like better. But lots of fruit set on these. And I like the fact that the plants are a little more compact and not quite so rangy. Can you guys see all that fruit set in there? So yeah, tomato season is coming along nicely. And then another hollyhock here at the end because of course, why not? All right, homesteaders. Throwing in in the middle of this video, I realized when I shot this that I completely skipped over the brassicas. And so forgive the lighting. It's much later in the day and we've got some full sun, but I wanted to show you where this cabbage was at. There were a few here that I've taken out that have been harvested. I got some nice three pound heads out of there. And I realized that this variety that I was telling you was so slow to form heads is actually a winter cabbage variety and it's a hundred day cabbage. And that is why I mentioned in my last video, it wasn't coming along, that's why. So that one is very, very long season. We'll see what we get. I have a few more out here that are just about ready to harvest. I decided to give them another day or two. Some ground cherries here that have been throwing off a few ground cherries. Delicious. Our stunning nasturtium. The very last of the Chinese broccoli that I've harvested a lot off of. And it's just finishing up and I'll pull these plants here pretty soon and the I think this is where I'm going to put the quinoa, is where some kohlrabi was right here. And then here's a couple of more cabbages that are ready to be harvested. So all together, I'll probably get 18 or so out of this bed in the early part of the season that are all about three pounds. And then here is more of that 100 day variety and I need to spray this. It's getting pretty bug eaten and I'm starting to see a lot of cabbage moths around. So this really needs to be sprayed. One more big one there that's gonna come out in a couple of days. Yet another hollyhock. I had great germination on hollyhocks. And then this is the broccoli. And so I've got four different varieties of broccoli here. This one is about ready. I harvested a bunch yesterday. And so I didn't do this one because it wasn't I think figured I could get another day on it, but you can see the size here. So that's probably a good, maybe five inches. I've grown them much bigger than this. I got these in late this year. And so they're not as big as they usually are, but I've harvested quite a few. You can see there, that's the cut stem. I will get side shoots off of this. And so I'll get another secondary harvest out of this bed for another couple of weeks before the plants are done. There's another nice head down there. Most of these are weighing in at just about a pound. I've had some that have been a pound and a half and some that have been under a pound. There's a nice big guy in there that'll come out in a few days. So these have come along quite nicely and then some of them are really, really late. I don't know what's going on with this. This end of this bed, I just think it didn't get tilled as much. And so I think the soil is probably a little bit more compact and probably not quite as good nutrition wise. And so these are really slow. This variety I'm very familiar with and it's not normally this late. So I'm not quite sure what's happening. I think it's a soil issue, but yeah, broccoli. Nice crop this year. Not as good as some years, but certainly quite decent and it's always tricky to know exactly when to harvest broccoli you want them to still have nice tight heads um, and when they start to open up a little bit then it's time to pull them this one is probably going to be ready in about a day this one is still nice and tight so again a day or two but they will grow 
you know, sometimes an inch or so larger just in a day. So it doesn't take very long for them to go from, is it gonna get larger? Maybe I can wait to it's time to harvest. I waited too long. So there is the broccoli. So that is the end of June garden. I'll give you a sweep from this side. Things are coming along nicely. Follow me on Instagram for pictures of harvests. I tend to throw things up there because it's quick and fun. All right, you guys, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. I have new content on cooking your harvest coming out every week. So join me for that. And we'll see you in a month for the next garden tour.